Well, Ishan Badia seems like a normal high school senior with ordinary interests and hobbies, but counters that with his obsession with the threat of insects, the threat that insects pose to agriculture at the global level. As the world population grows, so does the need for increased food production <clears throat> and the constant fight to protect crops from insects. But are traditional chemical pesticides really the answer? In tonight's presentation, Ishan will discuss his ideas and research into finding an alternative to traditional chemical pesticides by using Cordyceps militaris. Welcome, Ishan. Thank you. All right, so I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna start by showing you guys a clip of a show that you might have watched or heard before, uh, The Last of Us. So that was kind of gross, right? Um, although this show is purely fictional and cordyceps mushrooms aren't specialized to zombify humans at all, uh, the way that these filmmakers portray cordyceps attacks isn't entirely inaccurate. Uh, so now let's look at a clip of how cordyceps attacks ants, this time in real life. Incredibly, 80% of all insects live in jungles. Few are more successful than the ants. There can be 8 million individuals in a single hectare. But jungle ants don't have it all their own way. These bullet ants are showing some worrying symptoms. Spores from a parasitic fungus called cordyceps have infiltrated their bodies and their minds. Its infected brain directs this ant upwards. Then, utterly disorientated, it grips a stem with its mandibles. Those afflicted, that are discovered by the workers, are quickly taken away and dumped far away from the colony. It seems extreme, but this is the reason why. Like something out of science fiction, the fruiting body of the cordyceps erupts from the ant's head. It can take three weeks to grow, and when finished, the deadly spores will burst from its tip. Then, any ant in the vicinity will be in serious risk of death. The fungus is so virulent, it can wipe out whole colonies of ants. And it's not just ants that fall victim to this killer. There are, literally, thousands of different types of cordyceps fungi, and remarkably, each specializes on just one species.
But these attacks do have a positive effect on the jungle's diversity, since parasites like these stop any one group of animal getting the upper hand. The more numerous a species becomes, the more likely it will be attacked by its nemesis, a cordyceps fungus. All right, so as I'm sure you all know, uh, fungi have been useful for a wide variety of beneficial applications, including food, medicine, decomposition, and biofuels. One area in which they may have some use is agriculture, specifically pest control, like what you saw in the second video. Right now, we are facing a global crop production crisis, where our production cannot keep up with the rate at which our world's population is growing. Insects don't help with this either, as they are responsible for the loss of 40% of world crop production each year, resulting in $70 billion lost annually. Currently, to combat this, the commercial agriculture industry uses chemical pesticides, which are harmful to both humans and the environment. Mycopesticides, which are derived from fungi able to control insects, have been researched as a beneficial alternative solution to these chemical pesticides. Four years ago, as a freshman in high school, I began my journey into this subset of mycological research, wanting to find a mushroom that could control insects without posing a threat to humans. I started by creating a list of potential candidates for use as a mycopesticide, the three being Metrohysium anisopliae, Bouveria bassiana, and Amanisa muscaria. All these species came with certain advantages and disadvantages, and I found it difficult to choose the best species. I decided to consult Ken Litchfield, who served 25 years as the mushroom cultivation chair of the Mycological Society of San Francisco, as well as a community college professor of mushroom cultivation for 10 years, and was presented with the genus I'd never heard of before, Bordyceps. After months of investigation and research, I decided that I would specifically use the species Cordyceps militaris to test the survival rate of Brevicorn brassicae, more commonly known as the cabbage aphid, using Brassica oleracea as a plant to host the aphids. In this presentation, I will present Cordyceps militaris as a mushroom, including what it is famous for, various biological mechanisms, and the various lifestyles of mushrooms, and how those relate to Cordyceps and its herbal and pesticidal uses. I will describe my experiment involving Cordyceps militaris, specifically the pre-experimental exploration period, the hypothesis, which was that Cordyceps militaris would prove to be an effective pesticide against cabbage aphids, the procedure, the collection and analysis of data, and the results and conclusions. So if I ask you what you know about the Cordyceps genus, chances are you've heard of its herbal health benefits due to its place in traditional Chinese and Tibetan medicine. First used in the Tang Dynasty in 620 BCE, emperors used this mushroom for longevity, virility, and aphrodisiac purposes. Starting in the 14th century, during the Ming Dynasty, physicians used cordyceps mushrooms to make powerful tonics that were promised to improve one's health as well as their liver, kidneys, and respiratory system. In fact, they were so prized that they are now studied scientifically and used to date in similar medicinal applications, as they increase oxygen utilization and ATP production in cells and boost immune cell activity. This is actually why, in the 1993 Chinese National Games, the women's track and field team broke nine world records. Although suspected to have used performance-enhancing drugs, they simply obtained the health benefits cordyceps mushrooms provide. So what causes these benefits? Some of these can be traced to a chemical found in cordyceps mushrooms called cordycepin, which benefits both the circulatory and respiratory systems by relaxing blood vessels. Because of this, the body experiences improved blood circulation, lowered blood pressure, and improved airway flow, reducing the risks of various cardiovascular diseases. Cordycepin also inhibits cell proliferation, which helps prevent cancer, enhances fertility, prevents melanogenesis, and provides antioxidative, anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial, anti-cholesterol, and anti-diabetic properties. Due to all of these numerous positive effects on an individual's health, we can say that cordyceps molotaris is likely completely safe for any human use, including potential usage as a pesticide. 
And while cordyceps may be helpful to us, insects do not share the same perspective. As you saw in the video, cordyceps appears to be controlling the insect's mind, essentially taking over its entire nervous system, causing it to climb up the plant, clamp its mandibles onto the plant, and put itself in a state of suspended animation, allowing for the dispersion of fungal spores into the environment. In the past, cordyceps mushrooms have been known in nature to parasitize insects and arachnids, although the knowledge of the scope of these targets is rather limited. For instance, Ophiocordyceps senescus, also known as the caterpillar fungus, has been known for the last few decades to attack caterpillars and moths, and Cordyceps molitoris has been known to attack ants. Because of this, they have been looked into as agents of pest control. I looked on forums discussing these mushrooms, and even in the past couple of years, people still only think Cordyceps is limited to ants or caterpillars. If that were actually true, I wouldn't be here talking to you all today. The truth is, there's a lot more out there that we haven't discovered with these mushrooms. Many of you are probably wondering what is behind the entomopathogenic or insect attacking capabilities of these mushrooms. Before determining its exact functions, it's important to understand what type of mushroom cordyceps even is. So there are multiple lifestyles of fungi, mycorrhizal, parasitic, and saprobic. So as you can see in these photos, the mycorrhizal lifestyle involves growing on living trees, and they often provide benefits to trees in the form of nutrients while getting nutrients in return, meaning the symbiotic relationship benefits both organisms. A few examples of this kind of mushrooms that you may have heard of are chanterelle mushrooms and candy camp mushrooms, both of which usually grow on oak trees, and porcini mushrooms and amanita muscaria, both of which grow on pine trees. Mycorrhizal mushrooms interactions with the trees creates a flow of nutrients between both species that serve to benefit their relationship. Moving on to the next lifestyle, the parasitic mushroom, which we can see growing out of an insect, gathers its nutrients from host organisms. Instead of improving the health of that organism, the parasitic mushroom removes nutrients from their host, benefiting their own health at the cost of the host organism. Some fairly well-known examples of these are huitlacoche, which can be seen growing on sweet corn in Mexico, and wild cordyceps, which grows on caterpillars in Asia, usually in the Himalayas. The last kind is the saprobic mushroom, which, instead of living mushrooms, gains its nutrients through dead organisms, essentially being a decomposer. The only benefit in gains is to itself and its ecosystem, since the mushroom is essentially cycling nutrients through the environment in this relationship. A few known examples of this kind of mushroom include the button mushroom, which commonly grows on cow manure, the morel mushroom, the maitake mushroom, and the lion's mane mushroom. So where does Cordyceps molitaris fit into all this? In the case of Cordyceps molitaris, it uses a combination of lifestyles to switch between food sources to maximize its survival, those being parasitic and saprobic lifestyles. The parasitic lifestyle feeds on insects in the wild and therefore has potential as a mycopesticide, while a saprobic lifestyle feeds on humus or the organic component of soil and is therefore grown on various grains. These two lifestyles create spores that generate the other lifestyle. So the parasitic lifestyle produces saprobic spores and the saprobic lifestyle produces parasitic spores. As a result, using the saprobic lifestyle will give us parasitic spores that will enable cordyceps molitaris to function as a pesticide. So now looking back at the original question, what is behind the entomopathogenic capability of cordyceps? The answer lies in having a parasitic lifestyle and the exact way that it works is pretty complicated. It first utilizes adhesion proteins that attach to insect exoskeletons and using a series of physical and chemical processes, weakens and eventually creates an opening in the insect's exoskeleton, allowing for a pathway to be established between the fungus and the insect. In terms of the insect's defense system, this is pretty significant 
the exoskeleton was the, only, the insect's only physical barrier against external threats. There are still a few internal barriers against parasites and pathogens. The major one being sensors inside the insect that would detect said parasite and appropriately respond using its immune system. Cordyceps molitoris bypasses this by sending chemicals to deactivate sensory receptors that would normally obstruct its parasitic behavior. Now that the insect is defenseless, the fungus can use its mycelium to feed on nutrients inside the insect host, colonize more spores inside the host, and propel these into the surrounding environment. This attack pattern is common amongst fungi within the cordyceps genus as a whole. They use physical and chemical processes to render the insect defenseless, giving it complete control over the nutrients inside the insect. However, the saprobic stage of this is quite simple and can grow on any non-living cellulose source, making its cultivation process simple, especially compared to its parasitic stage. I myself found it quite easy to grow saprobic cordyceps molossar spawn on millet grain, and it's known to grow very well on brown rice, which is understandable as it is loaded with nutrients. Here is um, Now, because growing parasitic and mycorrhizal mushrooms requires the existence and upkeep of a living organism host, which requires a lot of resources and care, these mushrooms are often highly valued and expensive to cultivate. For instance, mycorrhizal mushrooms like the chanterelle, porcini, and candy cat mushrooms usually average from $15 to $50 per pound due to their complex growing conditions. Moreover, wild-crafted parasitic cordyceps mushrooms can go for about $22,000 per pound due to the way in which they are harvested, while other parasitic mushrooms, like the huitlacoche, go for at least $30 per pound, making it at least five to six times more valuable than the sweet corn it grows on. On the other hand, because of their decompositional nature, saprobic mushrooms don't go for nearly as much due to their much more simple growing requirements. Instead of a living organism, saprobic mushrooms can grow on nearly anything that has some sort of nutritional value to them. As a result, the most luxurious saprobic mushrooms, like the morel, only go for about $30 per pound. The ones that are common and cheap to grow, like the button mushroom or portobello mushroom, go for, on average, $2 to $10 per pound. In the context of my experiment, saprobic cordyceps molitoris mushrooms grown in China and sold in the US goes for about 15, $5 to $15 per pound. I personally bought them at about $24 per pound uh, from Berkeley Bull and uh, Far West Fungi. But, and so while this doesn't sound as cheap as $5 to $15 per pound, it's a lot better than $22,000. So, the reason why I'm going into all these prices is because of practicality. We don't want to explore the usage of a pesticide with, without checking if it even has a place in today's industries. Well, even though cordyceps has a parasitic lifestyle, making that type expensive to cultivate, its saprobic lifestyle is what allows us to grow cordyceps molitoris mycelium at such a low price, which can later be grown into valuable parasitic fooding bodies that can attack insects. In this way, it is especially viable to use cordyceps molitoris for practical applications. Now, all this research established a very in-depth understanding about cordyceps molitoris and how it can be utilized in an experiment. However, where does it go from there? How does this make its way into an actual experiment? Let's go back to the very beginning, where I actually began to work with, and not just research, mushrooms, and plants. During this beginning period, I started working with Kent Litchfield in January 2020 to acquire hands-on cultivation experience with mushrooms, as I had never worked with them before. I started with an easy-to-grow mushroom, the oyster mushroom, and attempted to grow them in various substrates in order to learn how mushrooms grew. While all of my attempts exhibited mycelial growth, only one bag resulted in fruiting bodies. After this, I looked into the garden giant, which was supposed to be another easy to grow mushroom. Uh, but after months of trying to maintain a sufficient growing environment, very little mycelium grew on the wood substrate. And although all this was a disappointment, 
It greatly helped me learn how mushrooms grow and how much time is involved to maintain the health of these organisms. A few months later, uh, the wood chips in this bin got mold, uh, so I had to dump the whole thing away. But these experiences were very useful for one grow course of small taurus starting in early 2020. At first, I tried growing them in agar jars um, using potato dextrose agar, um, but I later found that using just plain milligrain was far more effective, and I'm sure producing fruiting bodies of Cordyceps mollitaris. In my case, uh, I started with just eight jars. And once each jar was full of mycelial growth, I took a bit of mycelial, mycelium infused grain from each jar and transferred them into eight jars each, each with a little bit of grain. And I continued the cycle until I had a few hundred jars. These jars would be used a few months later in preliminary testing of Cordyceps mollitaris as a pesticide. But of course, in order to do any experimentation, I needed to grow plants. I did not have any plants that could house pests in my garden or my backyard, nor did I have any pest problems. As such, I needed to transform this backyard into an insect haven by growing plants that were targeted by certain pests, releasing chemicals and attracting these pests to my garden. Once enough pests had infiltrated the target plants, I could be begin spraying cordyceps on them and document the results. In June 2020, I set out to begin this process with my first preliminary generation of plants. Yes, this was way over two years ago, almost three, uh, and evidently it took a lot of time to get everything to work properly. In two large bins, one being the control group and another being the experimental group, I planted 32 cabbage plants, and 48 kohlrabi plants, distributed evenly among the two groups. Despite my backyard being surrounded by shade, I managed to position the plants so that each bin would get more sunlight at different times, evening out their growth conditions. Some obstacles still persisted, involving squirrels trying to dig up the soil. Although annoying, these challenges provided lots of experience that was invaluable later on. Uh, when winter came later that year, I had to construct a greenhouse to protect my plant's environment from rain. And through this, I had unintentionally created an environment that was perfect for insect colonization, full of plants, damp, not too bright, and closed off. So now, during the next few months, from December 2020 to March 2021, Thousands of aphids multiplied and swarmed around my plants to the point where every time I entered or exited the greenhouse, I would be completely covered in aphids. And, you know, I had to shake it off and it, it was pretty gross. Um, and it sounds unsettling, but for this project, there was this was like finding gold because now I had test subjects. So starting in January 2021, I sprayed numerous mixtures on aphids to test their survival, establishing preliminary results with Cordyceps mollitaris. I started with a couple hundred milligrain jars I grew earlier by blending a jar's context with water and filtering it with a sieve and cheesecloth, resulting in a liquid with a water-like consistency, making it easy to spray. Without the cheesecloth, it would have been quite thick and gloopy, um, and that would just clog up the sprayer. Um, I also made sprays with just grain and no mycelium, as this would prove whether aphid mortality was caused by the mycelium or the grain itself. So I treated the grain spray like a sort of control group and the grain and mycelium group as the experimental group. My mycelium sprays work quite well as most of the plants initially swarming the plants died. Ken suggested that I add diatomaceous earth to the spray since it's known to have abrasive properties that, that weaken the insect's exoskeleton. However, it didn't help too much probably because Cordyceps mollitaris already accomplishes the physical and chemical penetration of the insect exoskeleton. A week after these tests, I sourced parasitic fruiting bodies of Cordyceps mollitaris, removing the need to grow them myself, and blended them into a similar spray. This entire process was much easier than when I grew the Cordyceps mycelium myself, 
in comparison with both the mycelium or the mycelium and diatomaceous earth sprays, the fruiting bodies spray was more effective while using way less resources, therefore being the most valuable option to use as a pesticide. And I had this in my slides before, but let me just go back quickly. Um, if you're going to source these yourself, th these are what mine looked like. Um, as I had mentioned, I got them from Far West Fungi and Berkeley Bowl. Um, and you're going to need to find a place that sells these fresh and wholesale, usually, um, or just any sort of supplier. Because if you buy it off of most like grocery stores, you're going to get something like this, um, which are tablets. And this is the most popular way to sell Cordyceps Montaris because it was used as a health supplement. Um, but these are what you're going to want to use um, for if, if you ever want to use it in your garden. Um, I had bought, you know, multiple two or four pound groups of these, um, and that lasted me for quite a while. Okay, so continuing on. Here are some pictures uh, showing the effects of the spray with the cordyceps pictures that I just showed. Um, that mixed with water. So this is the result of that spray in my experimental group of plants. Um, and as you notice, uh, there's a lot of bands. Uh, it's kind of like they look like there's little bands of aphids in which there are just stripes of uh, aphids completely missing. Um, and a lot of the aphids that were very nice and plump, very, you know, gray, um, they look shriveled. They look a lot smaller and they look a little bit green. Uh, this dark green color does indicate that they are dying. Um, and yeah, when they're shriveled up, that just means that their insides are kind of just gone. And what's left is this the husk of the insect. Um, and so as you can see, you know, the before and after, there's a lot of clearing up that's being done. Um, here's another picture. Uh, it's kind of more side by side, not really like a uh, like overtime thing. Um, but you can see the huge difference between if I hadn't sprayed this and if I had sprayed this. Um, and yeah, the plants are drooping a little bit, so they are dying right now due to how many uh, insects are on them. But you can see really why they're drooping. It's, it's thousands of aphids on each plant. Um, unfortunately, as the saying goes uh, by Pony Boy Curtis, if you've ever read The Outsiders, uh, nothing gold can stay. Uh, apparently, thousands of aphid swarming plants aren't too great for their health and uh, as useful as those thousands of aphids were and as much as i had really loved my two bins of 70 plants you know those plants that were used to propel my discovery quickly died as the aphids consumed their nutrients and despite me fertilizing and transplanting the plants and killing all the aphids using the cordyceps solutions all the plants died by june 2021 and uh if you remember from before these plants, they had grown so much taller and they had all just died out. So during this time, if you look to the right, uh, I was actually growing another set of plants. So in early 2021, I researched pea aphids instead of cabbage aphids due to me realizing that, you know, from the whole thing with growing my own cordyceps or sourcing them, uh, sourcing my materials online could save a lot of effort, resources, and time. But pea aphids can't grow on Brassica oleracea. So I started to grow fava beans from seed as my second generation of plants, which is actually quite difficult as I had to learn to germinate them and then cultivate them in bits. I learned that if you put too much water in these, you know, to make them sprout, uh, they're actually going to become anaerobic and all these seeds will die. So if you're going to grow fava beans, don't do that. Uh, just put them in a damp towel uh, instead of actually submerging them in water. Uh, but during this time, I researched about using pea aphids instead of cabbage aphids. Um, and because, you know, they were able to be purchased online, but the starter population that these purchased aphids provided wasn't enough to sustain a large enough population for use in an experiment. So next to these plants, I had this cup with like a decomposed fruit in it. 
that you know the aphids would feed on for the time being. Um, and most of them were dead by the time they arrived. I hadn't expected a package full of aphids to survive, um, and they didn't. Um, so yeah, you know, while it wasn't worth sourcing the pea aphids online and growing these fava beans, it was certainly worth sourcing the cordyceps fruiting bodies online. My third generation of plants began in the blazing summer of 2021. Due to high temperatures, I thought it was best to prevent the overheating of these plants by placing them in a greenhouse. Because I was tired from the first two generations of plants, I resorted to using pots for each individual plant to avoid lugging around huge soil-filled bins in the heat. Surprisingly, uh, this wasn't any easier as it meant taking care of 72 individual pots. But it was kind of convenient in a way as this concept was modular, allowing me to rearrange each plant to create uniform control and experimental conditions. Um, it was quite a lot of work because I had two groups of 36, and once some plants took off and one, some lagged behind, I had to keep moving them around. And so this, this ended up being a lot of work. Um, but on the bright side, it did end up creating a very nice uniform two groups. Combined with the greenhouse, um, this modularity was supposed to make growing these plants foolproof. After the last two generations, I thought I had the growing process down. Uh, but in reality, covering the plants with both the greenhouse and trees simply prevents photosynthesis from occurring as it blocks too much sunlight. And placing plants in pots severely inhibits their root growth and therefore makes them far less robust. So as a result, all 72 plants died by the end of the summer, despite my efforts to fertilize and cool down the plants via a swamp cooler, which you can see in the right picture. But at this point, I knew how to grow plants. Don't let them burn in the sun, but make sure they have sun to grow in. Don't drown them, but make sure they have enough water. Don't fertilize them too much, but make sure they have enough to kickstart their growth. And obviously, transplant when necessary to maintain two uniform groups. My last generation of plants for the final version of the experiment had begun in August 2021. For this, I bought 54 red cabbage plants and placed them into nine bins with six plants per bin. Each bin was small enough so that it was easy enough to carry around and had enough soil and nutrients for each plant to have room to grow in. While not being as modular as having individual plant pots, having small bins like this made enough, maintained enough modularity to provide two uniform control and experimental groups. One bin was to be used as an extra bin in case anything went wrong, and the remaining eight bins were to be used in the experiment. Towards the beginning of December 2021, it started to rain a lot, like the first generation, so I placed a greenhouse over the plants. Thankfully, they didn't die this time, as they were initially fairly robust, and just like in the first generation, colonies of aphids started to swarm the plants. Once the plants hit their peak health and had sizable colonies on each plant, and I could tell this was the case due to them not really growing as much anymore and experiencing ever so slight decrease in health, so that was their peak. But at this point, I decided it was time to start my experiment at last. So <clears throat> I've already mentioned the procedure of this experiment involving the setup of the plants. Um, so let's talk about the cordyceps part of it. Uh, here are my sprays, um, photographed quite cinematically. Uh, they're nice, beautiful, uh, bright orange. The, the color of the fruiting bodies. If you are to make these with from grain, they're going to look more beige-ish. Um, so, you know, this is how it looks. On a side note, ever since I made these types of sprays, um, this is the only batch that's remained to stay this orange. Usually they turn a really dark orange for some reason. If that happens, it's fine. Um, it's just if you leave it like just standing there, they're going to turn a really dark orange, almost reddish orange, uh, which is kind of weird. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're going bad or anything. Um, <clears throat> but these sprays are made using a three-fourths ratio of cordyceps, miltars, fruiting bodies, and tap water. 
specifically one cup of water and three cups of cordyceps maltars fruiting bodies. Um, so, you know, I... So here's me putting it in a blender. And then comes the water. After this, you're just going to blend it uh, until the mixture is of kind of a smooth consistency. Uh, the mixture was then filtered twice using a muslin cloth, uh, one for each filtration. And the liquid was distributed into 16 12 ounce spray bottles, like the ones that were pictured before. And uh, here is the final result. It, it gives a nice spray due to the filtering of the muslin cloth. Uh, a lot of the chunkiness of the cordyceps uh, is removed. And all that's left is water and a little, like the very fine particles of cordyceps maltars. Do note that all these measurements are imperial instead of metric. You know, the three-fourths cup and, uh, of um, cordyceps and then one cup of water. Um, and so while the metric system is a scientific standard, as this was a scientific experiment, I use the imperial system due to it being easier to use in a gardening-based set setting. So usually farmers and gardeners would use the imperial system more. Um, but fu for future experiments, it will be imperative to use the metric system. The water spray was made by filling the same kind of 12-ounce spray bottles with tap water acquired from the same faucet. So now it's kind of a similar thing as what I had before with the, the grain and the mycelium and grain. It's just water and water and cordyceps. So the water's the control, the water and cordyceps is the uh, experimental group. So this experiment consisted of the documentation of three springs of water and cordyceps on the two groups spread across eight days, documented in the diagram as shown. During the spring process, the bins were placed two feet apart from each other to avoid any contact or interference between the bins. Approximately two and two thirds ounces of solution, whether it was cordyceps maltaris or water, was sprayed on each plant per spraying session, amounting to 192 ounces of cordyceps maltaris and 192 ounces of water solution sprayed throughout the entire duration of those eight days. This experiment involved three systems of visual documentation, the baseline pictures, the individual pictures, and the point of interest pictures. Both the control group and experimental group were documented throughout the duration of the experiment. The baseline pictures were taken to showcase the overall health of the plants, whereas individual pictures and point of interest pictures were taken to establish a visual numerical documentation of the aphids. On each day, the plants were documented via photography at 1 o'clock p.m. to 3 o'clock p.m. The methods of documentation that were used on each day are shown in the diagram. This might be a lot of information to take in, so all you really need to know is that on days 2 through 7, I took pictures of each individual plant, which would then be used to establish a survival rate, which I would have to count manually. Days 1 through 8 were really just introductions and conclusions, respectively. Speaking of survival rate, how did I establish that? Let's start with the pictures themselves. In order to create consistent results, I needed to make sure that the position in which I took the picture for each plant was the same across all days, and that I would be counting the same areas of the plant within each picture. Even if, for instance, part of the plant drooped over or shifted a certain way, I ensured that I counted the aphids within all the pictures in a consistent manner for each plant so I could make this process as objectively accurate and scientific as possible. So here are going to be some before and after pictures of the control group and the experimental group. As you can see, um, not much of a change. There's still swarms of aphids on the plant before and after, and the plant is starting to shrivel up a little bit. And here as well, there's a little bit more of a decrease, but there's still a lot of aphids in this plant. Not so much for the experimental group, which as you can see, that cluster of aphids on the center is pretty much completely gone. It's only about 10 aphids in this picture, in the picture remaining. 
And here, similar thing, a lot more of a clear than the first uh, set, but almost all the aphids, especially on the, the large plants, they're gone. On. And it's easiest to deal with the fine surfaces of the uh, center uh, uh, of the cabbage. And so I noticed that um, most of my, like after the first day of spraying, most of the first day deaths were from aphids on those flat surfaces. So on plants with more flat surfaces, not this coagulated mess in the middle. Um, Cordyceps and Moltaris will be extremely uh, powerful on those plants. There, it'll be a lot less time needed to completely wipe out those insects. Um, but there's a lot more pictures like this. And from here, I basically had to go through every single picture. Um, and there are 288 of them. And I counted every single aphid on each picture. This entire process spread across you know, two weeks. Uh, took around 24 hours total, and I counted a little over 10,000 aphids to establish survival rates for both the control and experimental group. So the results of this are shown in the table. So the table displays six days for counting both the control and experimental aphid populations. For each group, there were four physical bins with six plants each that were represented in the table. The control group using the water spray went from 100% aphid, sur aphid survival rate in the first day to an 82.71% aphid survival rate in the six-day period, or 17.29% mortality rate. So not really that high, probably due to um, the aphids drowning in the water or being knocked off. Um, and the daily survival rates of each aphid can be seen in the survival uh, in the table. But as you can see, they didn't experience that much of a decrease throughout the experiment. On the other hand, the experimental group using the cordyceps spray percent survival rate to an 8.07% aphid survival rate in the six day period, or a 91.93% mortality rate. So compared to 17%, it's a lot more. takes into account the control group. So because it had a 17.29% mortality rate, the corrected mortality would go from 91.93% to 90.25%. So even when accounting for the small mortality rate in the control group, the mortality rate for the experimental group, the cordyceps mortaris, is still very high. And as we can see with this, we can see a massive drop on the first day reducing the aphid population to just 30% of its original size in one day. And from there, the aphid population decreased at a smaller and smaller rate until observing a roughly 50% drop in population size from the previous day on the last day. I wanna just highlight a few notable drops that I saw. Um, one of the plants went from 133 aphids to just 17 aphids on the next day. One of them went from 132 aphids to 29 aphids. One of them went from 120 aphids to 44 aphids. One of them went from 57 aphids to 14 aphids. You get the point. Um, from this, I developed basic statistics for this data, one being the derivative, which showed that the control group's aphid population decreased at a relatively constant and minuscule rate. All this means is that the huge drops that we see in the experimental group are for sure caused by cordyceps molotars, and that the results that we see are statistically significant. Um, so as shown by the results, it is clear that cordyceps molotars is far more effective at controlling pests than water was, and shows that cordyceps molotars is certainly viable to use as a pesticide against cabbage aphids, proving my hypothesis as correct. Considering previous research was only limited to ants and certain caterpillars or moths, this is pretty significant as it expands the range of insects that Cordyceps mellitaris may be able to infect and shows just how much more there is to be explored with these fungi. We've only really scratched the surface of what these entomopathogenic fungi can do. 
My research, like others before it, presented interesting challenges to overcome. Some of the largest challenges definitely involved growing the plants, as I always had some sort of health problem and often died during the growing process. It was also hard to cultivate a sizable aphid population, as they only colonized the plants during certain times of the year. This greatly limited the times in which I could start the experiment and overall took the experiment much longer to complete. As for where this project can lead us, I researched agricultural applications made in commercial agriculture. And Cordyceps molitoris can certainly be used in a similar fashion as the fruiting body solution I created. Most pesticide applications are accomplished with industrial sized sprayers, like the one shown, which could be definitely used with Cordyceps molitoris with potential cost savings for companies and farmers alike. And of course, it's healthier. In the future, the fruiting body concentration may not need to be as high, since I used a lot on the safe side, but a perfectly optimized solution may be more resource efficient. When I calculated a more resource efficient way to use Cordyceps molitoris, I found that you only need to use around half as much or even a fourth as much to get a similar covering on the plant. You can cover a plant with much less Cordyceps molitoris as needed, and you can dilute the solution even further, bringing costs down by a lot, probably around an eighth of the original cost used in this experiment. And not only that, if cultivated as a pesticide grade product instead of a food grade product, which I'm sure mushroom cultivation experts know how to accomplish, the cost to produce these pesticides would be even lower, such that farmers could, you know, it would be very attractive for them to buy and apply it on their crops. If we study how these fungi work to attack insects, we can also identify certain substances that will enhance these mechanisms to become even more effective against insects while maintaining our health and safety. From those creepy creatures shown in the beginning of this presentation, who would have thought that this would actually be a lifesaver for the global pro crop problem in the near future? Thank you. Sorry, I was on mute there. Um, thank you uh, very much for this excellent presentation. Um, thank you. My number one question is, um, are you going to be a mycologist when you grow up? Um, and I mean grow up in the like funny way. I, you're a fully fledged adult, but like yeah, yeah. a passion yeah. of yours? Um, um, I'm interested... This has not not directly into mycology, but I do like the way um, I, I like studying the way that you know cordyceps attacked insects. Um, so because of that, I'm very interested in biochemistry. I'm going to study biochemistry in college next year, um, mainly because I really like the step by step processes of like stuff like this, you know, in nature. Um, so I might continue, you know, researching a part of fungi in that. Um, and I might research other things as well, but you know, it's definitely going to still be in my scope. Um, yeah. Well, I, I I hope you all the best. I mean, you Thank sound you. very smart and very methodical. Um, do you like to eat mushrooms? Yeah, I'd actually tried these. I had tried um, cordyceps mushrooms once. Uh, I kind of just sauteed them and put a little bit of oil on them, and it, it, they were pretty good. They tasted kind of nutty. A little bit a little bit of sourness too um but it was still good yeah yeah I, i've never eaten cordyceps i've taken uh cordyceps uh supplements um but um i'm anxious to try them yeah um, they're good yeah i'm 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 just so excited about young scientists i mean thank you whatever science you go into right yeah yeah thank you so much you're welcome does anybody have a question they'd like to Ask Ishan. Well, I'd like to thank uh, thank you, Ishan, for a terrific presentation. You did a great job, and uh, we learned a lot collectively. And uh, thanks, Ken, for bringing Ishan to our attention. Uh, this was a great evening. Uh, I'd like. I also like to thank Ken. Thank you uh, for mentoring Ishan, and. Um, everything else you do for the club. Um, yeah, okay. Anybody else? Any questions? Any comments? 
Yes. Um, uh, just to make it clear, so what what makes you think that uh, this will not be applicable to humans, for example, like in the in the movie? Why why will the a mushroom will not be able to uh, you know uh, break into uh, you know our system uh, and uh, you know do the same to uh, as for the insects? Um, I think it's because our immune systems are a little bit more powerful than the ones inside of an insect, so they would be able to kill off the spores. Um, another thing is that inside um, of, you know, in my experiment, um, I hadn't actually seen mycelium uh, actually um, grow out of the insect. So I don't actually know if it's the spores that attack them or some sort of chemical produced by cordyceps. Uh, in that case, it might be more of the aphid small size being really just susceptible to these. Um, yeah, so I think that um, cordyceps is just, for now, you know, very specialized to insects. Um, so I would imagine it might have more trouble with even larger insects. So I do think that we're safe because, you know, we're a lot larger than the largest insects. Right. And and we are fairly closely related to fungi, so that may be a factor. That's true as well. Yeah, we're, yeah. we're farther from insects. Yeah. Well, we know we're still affected by uh, nail fungus, for example, and it's pretty hard to get rid of. So uh, yeah. we are not immune to uh, to all of them. So uh, that's true as well. They don't reach the brain, just the toes. But uh, you know, let's be careful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. True. Yeah. That's, that's um, a fair point. Might be more poisonous than the infection, right? So don't want to kill the host. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I have I have a comment. Um, th this sounds like something that organic farmers would be really interested in, and uh, th they're already using bacteria to kill off insects. But a fungus would be another uh, weapon in their limited repertoire. Anyway, um, at some point you might think about hooking up with a tiny nursery and uh, let them do the growing skills because sometimes your skills don't include that kind of thing. And it's easier if somebody that's an expert at growing stuff does the plants and you can just work on the experiment. Just a suggestion. Yeah, I think in the future I would definitely do that. Um, yeah, this is, this is definitely a lot. Um, I do know that, um, Yablo Valley College had tried out uh, an experiment um, after I had given uh, a speech to them, and um, it, it did work similarly. Um, so I think, yeah, um, what organic farmers could do is definitely um, use cordyceps multaris on their plants uh, and test it out on different insects, you know, and, just to kind of see which ones more it could work on. And check the uh, amount of... Uh, concentration you need so yes. you can get it down to the minimum that that yeah. will make production a lot easier definitely yeah because right now um the cost is a little bit more than two to three times as expensive as um pesticides are selling for now but um it can definitely go down way below that so so we're, we're having a hard time um getting someone online who is here. Uh, Ken, can you hear us okay? I guess you're unmuted, but not unmuted. Um, let's look at the uh, chat. Um, Greg W says, is there any info on how cordyceps would affect the further up, I'm sorry, affect further up the insect side of the food chain? Would there be an issue with Cordyceps militaris as an insecticide affecting non-pest insects? Yeah. In particular, maybe a topical conversation. Yeah, about bees. Um, I remember that Ken said that um, it was fine for bees. Um, I, yeah, I think it's more going to attack more uh, caterpillar-like in, uh, insects, but it is good to test that out just to make sure it doesn't attack bees because that would not that would not be good oh we love bees yeah they're bees. really important we do not need them to die out no for sure um, yeah 
there's, there's somebody another else comment asked, yeah. about um humans being warm-blooded and cordyceps like colder critters that I mean, that could be true yeah that could be true yeah okay okay ken is in the chat now saying that even though he's unmuted we can't hear him and oh, we don't see that he's muted um ken would yeah. you like to comment via text In the meantime, I guess I could answer uh, James's question on what are the next steps? Do you see another experiment in the future? I I do see another experiment in the future um, on a larger scale with more insects. Um, you know, there's a lot of different uh, insects that do attack uh, crops in general, like loopers. There's like these, I, I forgot the name of them, but they're very similar to an aphid, uh, but they're very small. Those would be important to test out on. I think the next steps are for as many people to test this out on different plants and different insects, just to make sure that they're, you know, just to, I guess, gather a list of all the plants and insects that this works on. Ken, are you there? Can you... So I, I'm sure you see this in the chat. Uh, Ken says, is Sean did a great job over the three years we worked together, and I'm sure we'll hear more from him. I, I hope so, too. Thank you for your presentation. Does anybody else have anything to say or ask? Anybody? Anybody? Okay, well, I guess um, this is a um, good night and thank you for your great presentation. Thank and you guys thank for you having for me. Your, your very early interest in mycology.